taxi Okay, I think we're going to get started. So this is IPSEC ME um, at IETF 99. Pass around. So we've got the blue sheet starting around. Uh, so I'm sure you've all seen this uh, multiple times this week. It is the new and improved note well. Um, please note that uh, there's an update on this uh, referencing RFC 8179, so please be aware of that. Uh, so today uh, we, have, uh, we have two note takers and a, and a Jabber scribe. Thank you. We got a rather full agenda today. Any agenda bashing? Yeah, well, we should have a, a few minutes for, for open mic. Uh, some, some quick status on our existing drafts. Uh, we have a number of drafts in, in the editor queue uh, that have just entered the queue, 4307 BIS and 7321 BIS are now in the queue. Uh, TCP and CABS has entered the edit phase. Uh, so we should be probably hearing from the RFC editors soon. Um, and we recently requested publication of um, EDDSA, uh, so we should be hearing from the ISG soon on that one. Um, we have a number, number of other drafts that are, are probably ready to advance. Um, we'll be talking about those as we go into, um, as we go through the, the updates on those drafts. So with that, let's talk about split DNS. Is it not? It doesn't seem to be so I was trying to look at, but then couldn't find any way to. It seems to be but And I was so happy we finally had these. <laughs> okay. There's a mirror in the back. <laughs> 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 okay, um, so split DNS. Um, th there weren't that many changes. Uh, it's just a small diff. Um, we we synced up the document uh, for the CFG request uh, reply payloads because we had come up with all these smart things of when we decided um, when we wanted a reply to be valid or not. But then it was pointed out that the core RFC actually tells exactly what to do. And uh, the summary basically says, as the, as the, as the pointer said, um, you can always send whatever you want, and you can always ignore whatever you receive. So we updated the draft to say that. Um, then Tero came up with an interesting use case where um, we wanted to limit the IP addresses reachable by the DNS server so that, um, so that we were sure that you were using the right technology for the right thing. And then Tero came up with this funny use case where he wants to do this on demand. So he wants the Ike to be able to, be able to notify the DNS servers, and then on demand when sending a packet to the, the DNS server, he wants the child essay to come up. So we changed the wording to say um, only unconfigure the DNS when the IG essay goes down, not when any of the IPsec essay goes down. And there's no more limitation that says you know the uh, DNS must the DNS must only be accepted if this um, IPsec essay is up. And then the interesting part is that um, I had sort of reluctantly agreed to change the presentation format to wire format um, based on the suggestion of um, tarot drop tables. Um, <laughs> and, um, and, and I'm actually backpedaling on this. I really don't like this. I really want to go back to the presentation format because I don't really want a DNS parser in my code. Um, I know that uh, one other implementation has the same thing. And um, I, I think this is, is, is a manageable security item in the implementation. And, and presentation format is just much nicer to have in configuration files. So we don't have to deal with DNS wire format. No, it's, uh, if it's a wire format, uncompressed wire format, it's totally trivial to do. 
you have the just the length of the label followed by the label, and you have uh, a, a zero zero, which is uh, empty label at the end. It's totally trivial to do, Bo both ways. So you're saying either one is fine with you? I say, I believe presentation format means a text tool, a text. So, uh, no, the way of format, it's, uh, uh, it's as least as easy. And uh, it's very easy, it's, it's better to, uh, for passing, etc. You can shake if uh, well formed, or, or etc. Just keep it uncompressed. You have the okay. possibility to compress it, which is a bad okay. idea. So, so you're saying you prefer wire format over yeah, presentation yes. format? Yes, okay. as a DNS person, I really prefer the wire format. Okay. And uh, it's, uh, you don't need uh, more than uh, two three lines of code to, to do the things. Uh, one question. So, so you were saying actually that one of the things we probably are missing, we should say that it's uh, uncompressed, or actually should we say it, it must be uncompressed DNS file? Yeah, it is, but... Uh, if we do we have any text about that in there? Not at the moment. Okay, so yeah, yeah, actually, it, it, that's actually one very good point. We want to have it uncompressed because uncompressed yeah, is so much better to that, easier that, to that, that is the follow-up question. Can I still go back to the original question? Do we want presentation format or wire format? And there is no. Uh, if you have escapes, etc., uh, wire format is is easier. But. It, I believe in this case you won't. Well, m most uh, most uh, DNS uh, configurations and most DNS administrators are really used to presentation format when they type in redhead.com. They don't really want to do like wire format in congressional. Uh, and uh, and as an example, if you now use a strong son who already implements these, you know, uh, this this configuration payload, put that format in, you can already use it if it would just be uh, uh, presentation format, but it doesn't support anything wire format. -y. Uh, Yes, I can use another mm. argument. In DHCP, we add uh, each two years for uh, new things, exactly the same yes, discussion. I, I, I understand. At the end, we, fi we finish with I understand the, the DHCP. Format. I understand the DHCP argument. I also talked to Paul Hoffman about this. And the only reason Paul Hoffman actually caved into the presentation format was that there was already three other use cases in DHCP that used the, that used the wire format. So only for consistency was an agreement to again use wire format. But we have no precedent here right now. This is the first time we're doing this. So it, the, the present here could still be just used presentation format. Tommy Polly. So as another author on this, I, I mean, I'm technically fine with either way that we go. I do also definitely prefer the presentation format to the wire format. Um, yes, I acknowledge that it's, it's simple to convert the uncompressed version. Um, it's easier to read the traces. It's easier for people to already configure the presentation format. That kind of works by default without changing any of the code for many implementations. Also, if we look at kind of the precedent, we do have config request and reply attributes, which are strings today. Um, we send identifiers, which are FQDNs, as essentially strings, and those are domains. And so we're like... <laughs> We do have cases where we send FQDNs as strings. Yeah, Mike, please. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, so in in uh, that okay, So, in all of the cases we actually send something, we send you know one item. We don't we don't send you know spaces space separated list of uh, uh, domain names or fully qualified domain names. Actually, when we are actually sending an email address, we are actually sending the email address part. Or I think we actually we are not we are not allowing you to have you know these comment fields and you know this all of the other things that is actually part of the email address. I think it's actually saying RFC eight two two address, which is only the address part, not the not you know mother. So so that's why I was saying that okay, we are not sending you know, config strings, we are actually sending items. It's have a very good, no, because here we have actually have a multi-line string having spaces, having both stuff separated or space separated list of, you know, items. No, 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 no. there are no lists. Oh, it, it, they're separate, they're separate, separate attributes. Every, so you give the DNS domain multiple times if you have multiple split domains. So, so you, you have, have any spaces, any no, no, no spaces. It's a fixed length. It says this is a fixed length of essentially ASCII or UTF-8 characters. And that is the domain. It's just like the FQDN. 
Yeah, but I mean, presentation format can have actually have, you know, all kind of other things also, if I understand correctly. If you're talking about same thing that we are actually having in, in you know, uh, for example, you have you have a, you have a, uh, backslashes. You can have a backslash new, new lines in there, which actually uh, you know goes. Through, it has escaping mechanisms. It, it has these kind of things you, in there. You need even to, inside the one label. Tero, you, the, if your concern is security on items and the string, then after you've uh, converted the wire format to presentation format, you still have to do your security because you still don't trust it. So the security checks are the same. Yeah, that's true. We will but one of the things I was also saying that okay, the, the, the var format also you are saying that it's easier to understand. But if you, you what you are using that you are looking for the you know the frames anyway, you are using Wireshark. Wireshark already knows how to you know decode the var format, so it actually will show you very nicely what what the, the DNS uh, var format looks like inside it. When, when, if it's I, a wire I, I don't know why Wireshark will know that this option contains a wire format. It, you just decode as DNS. That's a default for format for Wireshark to do things that you, when you have inside some other fields, you have other formats. I, okay. I still find the, the security item uh, minor, but. Right. Yeah, I guess I, I don't see the clear benefit to the wire format um, because it doesn't seem to increase the security because we have to convert into presentation format anyway the moment we get it. And it, it is a kind of unprecedented thing within Ike. So we've been talking about this, I think, for the last couple of cycles, and it doesn't seem like we've actually made any progress on this decision. So I would, I'd like to do a hum on, on this. Um, so I, I have a question because I can't see the zero 01 uh, draft, and uh, I've only the zero 00. Uh, even if you do presentation format, don't say it's ASCII. It's any byte. Uh, including dot, I believe it is allowed in uh, uh, in labels. I don't think we say ASCII now. I think we say DNS presentation format. Oh, actually, sorry, it, no, it, sorry. It, the draft it, currently says DNS it, wire format, but we would change that to say DNS presentation format, and we will not say whether it's Punicode or ASCII or UTF-8 or whatever. Yeah, and the zero zero say ASCII, and it says there is no trailing dot, because presentation <laughs> format you have to. For, for right. you can, if I do domain name, you should have a dot at the end. Okay. And actually, if the trust anchors are they actually really one string and not? No, no. The, the the trust anchors are split on the field, and actually the the field content is uh, it specifically says raw. So it, it actually it actually the the binary, not the base sixty four or the hex format. So so there you are using. Semi wire format, but not uh, pre not presentation format and not wire format. I agree. I would prefer presentation format there too. <laughs> okay. So the 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 choice before us is uh, is whether to use presentation format or or wire format. Uh, so. I don't care. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I think most of the people are. Sure, we can do we can do that too. Um, so we'll we'll hum first for uh, for presentation format, then wire format, then don't care. Uh, so those that are in favor of presentation format, please hum. Okay. Those in favor of wire format, please hum. <laughs> All right. Uh, those that don't care, please hum. As I say, please ask for don't care. Okay. It looks like don't care wins. <laughs> <laughs> Which means that the, you know the authors can go with the presentation format. And actually, one of the things I want then, then I want to have an examples also about all of this, you know, including that uh, you know trust anchors. Great. If we could record that in the notes. Is that it, Paul? All right. Next, we have implicit IV. <laughs> Hi. So, well, I think, well, so that the implicit IV for, um, Counter-based ciphers, it 
in IPsec. Um, so basically from the last version, the thing we added, basically from the last version, well, it's hard for me to, re to read in the mirror, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> No. <laughs> so the, the only thing we added is um, a, a reference to Beast, which is um, somehow the vulnerabilities um, that has been uh, subject to in uh, TLS. And well, that was all the comments from our from Eric. So this is the only comment we, we, we add. And I think we are done. So for those who don't remember the content of the draft, we can have it in 15 seconds. Also, oh, Eric, yes, this is your comment. <laughs> yes, so. Okay. Uh, so can I get a show of hands to see who, is, who has reviewed this draft? So what, three or four? Uh, what do you think? It would be nice to get some more review, um, but we could do that in a different group as well. Um, so does anyone have any concerns with moving this draft forward to working group last call? Okay, so we will uh, we'll issue a working group last call on this um, after after this meeting. Thank you. We have quantum resistant Ike. This is going to be Scott remotely, right? Yeah. Scott, would you jump into the queue? Thank you. It's right behind you. Okay. Um, yes, this is about uh, the quantum resistant Ike. Uh, let's see. Next page. Um, yeah, but very quick background, just in case any, anyone's missed it. Um, we're with we're talking about uh, quantum resistance uh, 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 of Ike. The problem with uh, with uh, with Ike as it is now is that if you have someone has a quantum computer, uh, they could break both Diffie Hellman and the crypt Diffie Hellman and read re all the secrets. Uh, we don't have any one with no one has a non toy quantum computer yet. But one concern is that they might be recording traffic now and then decrypting them later, five, ten years, when they have a real quantum computer. Next. Now, there are, what do we do about this? Uh, the short-term strategy is to simply just have both sides have a shared secret and stir that into the right key. Uh, if, the secure, if the secure secret is strong, they can't, uh, that, that we're, we're secure. A long-term strategy is, is, of course, to extend the I to, to, to talk up to actually use a post-quantum key exchange key agreement protocol. Um, this talk, uh, what I'm talking about is the short term. The next two talks will be about the long term. And the next, next page. Uh, next thing. Uh, in the previous working group meeting, uh, we, we talked about, we, we agreed on the basic approach, which is uh, in the draft, uh, with, we, we made the following tweaks, we simplified how it was negotiated, uh, so that both uh, initial exchange, they both uh, negotiate they're both doing this, and then during the key, uh, key agreement, they actually... Uh, they actually, uh, they actually, and an encrypted message that they also, the initiator says, uh, says which which uh, 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 a label of what which key they're using. They poster it into their uh, SKDs, PIs, PRs, and then basically everything, and, and all uh, uh, all keys derived from the initial, key, I guess, they are actually just protected. Um, uh, the only caveat is that the initial ISA and uh, and things like traffic selectors and things like that are not protected. Uh, and if the, the third thing, which was was agreed upon, is to, to suggest how PPKs are to be transported out of band between the systems. Um, and that's the summary. Now, next page. 
Okay, uh, basically we updated the draft, I have a we have a test implementation, and quite frankly, um, I haven't heard a whole lot of comments on the mailing list about it, so uh, is there any comments from from the from from, uh, from the working group? I see people lining up to talk. Just a quick note, uh, we have two other discussions on this, or two other presentations on this topic, so I'd like to hold comments to this draft specifically, uh, and then we'll talk about broader comments later. Okay, uh, follow up, okay. Uh we're, act we're actually working on implementations, so I will ping you soon to do oh, some intro. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, if, as I said, I have one, we have one, so we can see if we can interoperate. Uh, Valery Smyslow for Lewis Plus. Uh, I haven't said about this uh, this particular approach. I think that uh, there is one uh, consideration that might be significant. So uh, in this approach, uh, PPK, PPK is used as an additional uh, uh, an additional credential to uh, to reach uh, post quantum security. So uh, it doesn't replace an ordinary credentials like certificates. Uh, from operational point of view. Uh, it means that uh, security administrator uh, should maintain two sets of security credential uh, certificates and PPKs pairwise. And you know, I think, uh, I suspect it will be a headache. And uh, at some point, uh, we will have, uh, we probably will have a situation where, when uh, security administrator just get rid of certificates uh, because they are useless from their point of view and uh, uh, will end up with PPK only. And it will mean that uh, they will use null, null authentication uh, in Ike, uh, and then uh, PPK to uh, authenticate the second Ike exchange. I just want this, this uh, um, problem to be considered into the, in, in the document and some text to be added. About uh, that. Okay, excuse me. Uh, what sort of text do you want to add to, to actually uh, suggest that sort of approach or to, to warn against that sort of approach? Uh, I think that uh, having to maintain two sets, two independent sets of security credentials for uh, in real world is a big headache. Uh, so uh, operators uh, will try to simplify their yeah. own life. Well, uh, one, my yeah, one possibility, of course, we don't actually men mention this on the draft, and that's, a, that's deliberate, is to actually use both pre-shared keys and PPKs and having them identical. Uh, well, either they will use group-wise PPK, or they uh, will get rid of certificates and use null authentication instead, and then use PPK to second to second authentication. So uh, if they use if they if they use group wise PPK, uh, I don't think that it's a good idea. We will we'll probably end up with like the one. Uh, that's not good. If they use null authentication for IKSA for first IKSA establishment and then uh, immediately do a uh, rekey with PPK. To get authentication, uh, to get authentication, to say that it will mean that the first IKSA will be using null authentication. It is okay, but it has some drawbacks. First, it is most acceptable to DDoS attacks. Well, it has a lot of drawbacks. They are, well, they are in the RFC uh, 7619 that describes uh, null authentication. They are listed. So I think that some text must be added about these two possibilities and um, what, uh, what drawbacks they both will bring. Because maintaining two independent okay. uh, sets of security is very difficult in a person point of view. Okay. Uh, could you then, can I uh, trouble you for to asking for the, uh, the text you would suggest? Then you can do that offline. Okay. Could okay. you actually submit the, the, the give, give me some, some text, text you, you would suggest? I'll try. Okay. Thank you. Yep. 
powerless. Yeah, I agree. We, we can simply say must not be used with uh, I, uh, null. Sorry, with the auth null because uh, there's no point anyway. Like you, you, like auth null is supposed to be you don't know this person and you will never authenticate them. And so having a, a out of bound uh, PPK negotiated already makes no sense in the context. So we should just simply yeah. say must not, and then, then, then this danger will be limited. I don't think that must not is appropriate because uh, you will exchange a PPK identifier then, so it's a kind of identification. Okay, thanks. Okay. So, actually, I have one question for you. So, so do you think that do you think that this uh, document is ready for the last call after we have discussed the, after adding this? Uh, uh, null authentication or multiple, you know, credentials as text. Yeah. But is there anything yeah. else that requires? Yeah, my, my opinion is is that it is ready. Uh, Dan Harkins. So uh, I, I noticed when the uh, the PPI ID is fixed, uh, it says the, both the PPK and the PPK ID are limited to be base 64 character sets. I'm wondering, why are you imposing a requirement on what the PPK itself is? And I can see if you want to limit what the ID, if you know, on a fixed ID, you're specified what the character set is. But why do you, why are you imposing this on the shared secret itself? Okay, uh, basically that was a, a suggestion uh, from uh, basically from the last working group. Uh, pre previous drafts did not have any such recommendations at all. Uh, I thought that that was a the sense of the working group that they wanted to make it easier to transmit the uh, to exchange the uh, uh, the, um, the, the the BPK. So, so in last uh, meeting we had this discussion, and people were saying, okay, having one format that is used by everybody is easier than you know. Otherwise, you have a hex format, you have binary format. Uh, if you have an ASCII format, then then people can't in insert uh, spaces or 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 uh, nulls there. So having base sixty four encoded stuff, inter configuration file, and in the actual you know data, and it doesn't really matter. My, my, my well, no, it does because it says it has to be a base sixty four character set. So it does matter. But my recollection of that conversation was that people wanted a way to, a standard way to distribute the PPK. And it does actually talk about RFC 6030, which I believe was my suggestion in the last meeting, to use this, the symmetric key uh, envelope that PKX came up with. And it already talks about doing that. So that being the case, why do you care what the format of the PPK is? I guess we'll find out. So, I thought one of the considerations was as well that uh, based on the experience with PSK is that people are afraid that uh, they will limit themselves to the ASCII set to avoid problems of incompatibility of misinterpreting the format of the PPK. And so people stick to a low entropy ASCII version instead of uh, using the full range of, uh, of randomness we have. And that using base 64 sort of um, makes this easier that everybody can use uh, a better entropy based uh, PPKs. Michael Richardson, plus 12 to what Paul said. I, I really think that if, if, if this is hard for people to enter and communicate, they just won't use it. And if they don't use it, then the feature will disappear. So I'm supporting what you want to say, whatever right. you said. <laughs> If it's not easy to use, they won't use it, and if they don't use it, it'll disappear from the products, and then when the, then it won't be usable because it won't actually be used, right? So. Valery uh, Spaslov, I just want to reiterate that the uh, problem of, of, of key distribution is out of scope of the protocol, so. Let's um, let's cut the line after this comment. Cool. Um, so just to try to clarify, Tom, Tommy Polly, clarifying and adding on to those. Um, you're right. I think what we want is it should be easy to configure, but also taking you in the direction of making it 
a strong key that's not just some set of ascii characters I, I like the current encoding um and it's up to the implementations to make sure that you can easily distribute it okay thank you uh so next up we have hybrid quantum safe key exchange for ikv2 Hi, uh, my name is CJ. Uh, next slide. So following on what Scott said, so basically this is uh, sort of a long-term solution to the threat when, who knows, a quantum computer becomes available. Uh, and if you were in the, uh, in the talk where Kenny talked about you should laugh at the first line, then we should add perhaps a big engineering problem. <laughs> and then uh, when it happens, obviously, then there are uh, uh, Diffie-Hellman, obviously, will be... Uh, uh, vulnerable and then there are also uh, works already uh, mainly research uh, in the area of uh, uh, quantum safe or, or post quantum algorithms and nisa you know um uh, having this uh, call of uh, uh, for uh, selecting standards for what uh, is uh, post quantum uh, algorithms and last thing i will mention about fips compliance and again the statement uh, from this that are uh, current vpn protocol are uh, ipv2 for example that uses the hellman if it is a uh, uh, FIPS compliance, and then by doing sort of a hybrid change, uh, uh, we, we believe that it is still uh, uh, FIPS compliant. Next slide, please. So what we uh, sort of uh, uh, proposed was that uh, to do uh, optional uh, key exchange, so having another key exchange in addition to uh, uh, the uh, Diffie-Hellman. And then uh, at the goal, basically, uh, we want to keep the minimum as possible on the, uh, on the modification to IV2. Uh, we want to maintain uh, the compatibility with IV2, and also, if needed in the future, who knows? Uh, we may want to face out those uh, keys that are vulnerable. Uh, next slide, please. So this is uh, the current. You know, it's still early days, and this is the the the, uh, the thing that we uh, think that might might work, right? So we add sort of a, a QSK over there as the uh, payload that carries this uh, additional uh, key exchange material, uh, and uh, it's. It is sent as part of the uh, uh, the uh, uh, I key, uh, Ike sort of a SA in it, and then the S key seed. Obviously, the computation of that will be uh, a, a concatenation of both shared secret, and then the form the format of uh, uh, of the QSK payload is very similar to uh, uh, the KE payload. Uh, next slide. So. Obviously, backward compatibility, it's uh, 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 something that needs to be addressed. So we thought of the following. Uh, let's say once need to implement a policy where we want to do a fallback uh, to allow uh, a classical sort of a, a essay to be, uh, to be established. So uh, basically, the initiator will send a, a set of proposals, some of them offering KE, and some will, will offer a combination of KE and, and uh, post-quantum crypto. And then, uh, obviously, one needs to mark the uh, uh, QSKE payload as uh, non-critical. On the other hand, if you want to uh, uh, have a policy where only uh, uh, sort of a, a quantum safe uh, tunnel to be established, then uh, on the uh, SA payload, we only offer proposals uh, that support uh, QSKE in combination uh, with KE. And if needed, then a QSKE payload uh, can be marked as uh, critical. So obviously, when the other side receive that, following RFC uh, 7296, then one should respond with uh, uh, no proposal chosen. But on the other hand, you know, we have received a number of uh, emails uh, unicast to us. Uh, people said that are in the actual implementations, this might not be the case, and also said that uh, potentially it might not be a good idea to introduce a new payload, but I'll come to that later. Next slide, please. I'm going to go through this very quickly. Uh, in, in child essay, obviously, it's uh, quite straightforward now. Uh, it's uh, the computation of a key mat. Uh, it's basically now requires a concatenation of the new element. Um, the same with the, uh, it comes to a, a rekeying of a child essay. Next one, please. Uh, likewise, on the rekeying the IKEA essay, uh, we, when there is a, a quantum say for key exchange, then we'll have a new element in it. Okay, so next one, please. Now, that was the easy part, right? And uh, the difficult part is these things. Uh, the trouble with the uh, uh, key exchange using quantum safe uh, uh, sort of payload is that it is very large. And uh, I have a question for that. Please. What do? What is large? <laughs> very good question. Well, I'll come to that. So, so we experimented with a number of them. Uh, the lattice-based system, you can get something like a thousand five hundred bytes or octets, right? Uh, 
there is a new one which Kenny mentioned as as not to exactly. invest. Uh, yeah. Let's get verify question. Is any of those more than sixty four kilobytes? There is one or two that might be uh, okay, the code based system. Because that that causes issues in 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 all of our cases because we are pretty much uh, pretty much limited to sixty four kilobytes in in, in a couple of other because we are sixteen bit uh, payload. Yes. Okay. Yes. So there's one uh, as far as I know code based systems. You're looking at uh, a couple couple of hundred of kilobytes of a public key. So, as Taro mentioned, because uh, he's uh, large in there, so we'll have trouble with uh, fragmentations, just like you know fragmentation of the group here. Uh, so we have considered a number of methods uh, to mitigate fragmentation. Uh, the first one we considered, for example, is that okay, we will use RFC seventy three eighty three. Apologies if I got the number wrong. Uh, to to use the fragmentation over there, so that means we send a QSKE payload as part of IKE auth. Unfortunately, after some consideration, we reckon that's not a good idea because then by then, if quantum computer becomes available, people will be able to de de decrypt part of the IKE auth, meaning that you re you reveal your identity. So we ditch that. And the next one, we thought that okay, in, in fact, quite similar to the first one. Why do you know? Why don't we just sort of uh, immediately rekey the SA once we've got uh, the IK auth established? And again, it's the same problem. The other one is that we pick a QSKE payload that has got a small uh, public key size. I mean, one of them, one of them that we considered is this uh, uh, SIDH, which uh, Kenny asked us not to invest yesterday. It's a very new uh, scheme, uh, 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 drop-in replacement to uh, Diffie Hellman. And that one, we experimented with that, and the key size only 600, 600 bytes. And that, you could send it as part of the uh, ISA need, and then uh, and then you sort of uh, uh, do more on the uh, uh, child SA. Uh, the other one, the next one is to use, uh, to introduce the next sort of a, a state in between. And then that, we think that it might be too heavy. And the last one, we sort of uh, became lazy. We use what uh, Tommy proposed, TCP encapsulation. Yeah, so um, TCP encapsulation or not, um, uh, I would encourage you not to let the best be the enemy of the good here. Um, you're primarily attempting to, I mean, this is all hedge. You're primarily attempting to protect the user data. If in a post-quantum world, the user identities are revealed, but the user data is protected, that's a lot better than nothing. Mm -hmm. And given that I'm worried that all the other things you're testing are impractical and won't work, mm -hmm. um, like the, the likely, it seems the likely outcome of, of 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 not doing one of these earlier ones that you say does not protect the user identity is nothing will happen at all. In which case, it'll be strictly worse than not protecting the user identity. Oh, so, thanks, Seth. So as you can find an elegant way to protect everything, I was just protecting, giving up on user identity and protecting other things. Okay. Thanks. Sorry, uh, Powers. So I, th I think we already considered giving up on protecting the identity against active attacks because the identity leaks anyway in ICOTH. If you're an active attacker, you can just do Diffie Hellman to them. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. So uh, one of the things we had when we were thinking this is the uh, There's when we were actually think about this previous uh, document. One of the idea we had there that we could actually use that to plug in uh, the real, you know, uh, key, key exchange methods in the in future, which would mean that the, we have uh, we run this uh, side method of generating the keys, and then we configure them as a PPK and PPK message. So so instead of so we before the I guess I in it and I uh, uh, as, uh, out we actually run some uh, something else that generates the PPKs that are using like. So that's actually one of the options. Some and actually, was, I think yeah. I, I actually I don't think you have it here. Actually, you had the, you had the middle, but I think it actually should be even before. Oh, you mean not even on the fourth one? There's something way before. Some, something you, and it actually might be using Coptic something. It might be using TCP. It might be using something because I I mean it's it's something that is you know thing that you need to do do beforehand. But depending on how much actually you trust the, and what kind of protocol, because some of those methods actually can generate you know you know multiple you know identities you can use. Mm -hmm. So you don't have actually necessarily need to run it on every single you know exchange. You can actually do something that you create you know ten of these identities you can use in the future or something like that. And and then when you run out before you run out of that, you do the next exchange again okay. and something like that. But I, it's 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 one of the ideas that I've had. And actually, I think the fragmentation losing the uh, Fragmentation is actually a good thing because actually one of the things we have, I think if I run correctly, the IKE SA payload 
yeah. uh, length is uh, 32 bits. Yeah. Only the UDP and all kind of that things are, are and, and single payload like the 16 bits. So actually we can have, you know, really huge uh, Ike payloads, uh, Ike buckets having lots of payloads in it. Mm -hmm. Each mm -hmm. payload must be less than 64 kilos. Okay. Thanks, Sarah. Valery Smyslov, uh, first uh, question about uh, the size of um, uh, this uh, exchange method. Uh, I'm not familiar with uh, them. Uh, can the uh, public key send uh, be compressed per public percent method? It's probably not because, you know, if you think about the keys, they are quite random. So even if you compress okay. it, then, okay. you know, there's not much gain okay. from there. But uh, yeah. Then uh, probably we need to consider a general generic Ike fragmentation for Ike as I need. Not? Yeah, uh, we, that was my next slide, actually. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I have another question, but probably, uh, well, uh, why do you need a new uh, payload to transfer uh, KSM and don't use KI payload instead. Uh, you've got it very will, good since before yeah. I seen much. Yeah, you've got a good question. I mean, I've got a few email unique has to us and also from Scott. And uh, the reason being is we thought that, you know, semantically it will look nice. But yes, you're right. It can also be done using existing uh, KE it will payload. Simplify, simplify all the uh, situations and be more compatible, backward compatible. And the only reason yeah. when you have both KE and KE, KSKA payload, the only reason that I'm, I can think of is that you don't trust that you don't trust uh, the security that the new key exchange method gives. So you combine both exchange method, traditional diffie Harman and yes. the new exchange. But if you trust, then why not get rid of uh, diffie Harman and transfer uh, quantum security uh, key exchange in KSKA payload itself, which will simplify all this. Yeah, at, at the moment, I mean, we see that as, as uh, you know, it's still in the transitional process. I mean, obviously, uh, existing equipment that uses uh, KE payload, people have got FIP certification and things like that. I don't think we can throw that out anytime soon. Yeah. Uh, next slide. So uh, after receiving a lot of this uh, uh, feedback, Unicast to us on this, so and also the, the, uh, men, uh, to answer some of your point is that we also consider if it's possible to, uh, to fragment uh, ISA in it. So one of the things we came up with is to use these things uh, on the initial sort of a, a exchange, you send sort of a notify payload to tell the other side, do you support that? If they do, then they come back with the cookies and, and also to uh, uh, respond with this uh, uh, QSKE notify. Basically that contains sort of a, uh, an indication that they support it. So within the uh, uh, SA, a payload, then there'll be a number of proposals uh, uh, sort of uh, um, indicated in there. Here we assume, uh, and again, using uh, the uh, the QSKE payload, but and again, the same concept, uh, we need to address that, that it can, it can also uh, be, be carried in the uh, KE payload. So we can see that uh, we try to send a number of uh, uh, sort of a fragmented version of QA, QSKE payload uh using these things i'm not sure it's a good idea yet but we are still exploring these things and then in order to do fragmentation i mean we add a, uh, some some fields in in the uh in, in in the structure and then there's also a field f next to a critical bit that is used to indicate whether or not there is a fragmentations in in this uh in in this uh, payload as i mentioned this is very very new we're still exploring these things and it's not even in draft I and mean, it's something that we uh, uh work on uh, uh after receiving a number of feedback on on this uh, next slide, please. So we also sort of uh, uh, got a source source code in this thing. So we use a uh, strong swan and uh, and people are, who are interested and obviously uh, is there. I mean, obviously fragmentation is not there yet, but uh, the the exchange uh, is sort of working uh, over there. Yeah. And uh, feel free to uh, uh, sort of uh, use it, and uh, it'll be uh, helpful to uh, hear any sort of feedback on on, on that and also on the, on the on the draft. Or maybe I do it later. After. No, sorry. So, I mean, do you want to do a question now or later after uh, Actually, Kai? Let's, let's do the presentation. There's no, there's no, I mean, this is all. Okay, so what I mean here is that uh, this, is, this is something that this new item is going to be tr requiring charter to update and actually details about how the how we actually put where and with what and what kind of bits and bytes and we put in there is uh, something that we need to decide in working group if we decide that we are actually going to work on that. And I think we are going to be deciding because there seems to be lots of interest in this. But anyway, so so I think it's uh, too early to start talking talking about uh, what kind of fragmentation and TCP and whatever where do we put those things. So, so 
Okay. Mark Zhorowski, NCSC. Uh, I'd like to um, thank CJ for his draft. I think it's a, a good good effort. I would support the document. Thanks. Uh, the one comment I'd like to make is uh, uh, I noticed in the draft you make um, mention of uh, specific algorithms for for, for, for key exchange, and you you, know, you have uh, certain values listed for them and, and public key sizes. I think it's probably premature to be doing that, and I think it's probably not appropriate for this particular draft. I absolutely agree with you, and that was basically sort of a legacy as we tried to put some numbers or strong swans so that you know you should take that. You should I mean I, I would treat it as sort of how one would do this thing when you know when it should one needs to do this sort of a key exchange. Right. Yeah. Paul Rogers. So, so during SAG, we just heard like a, a, a optimistic estimate of like, this will take seven to 10 years before we figure out which algorithms we're going to use. Um, so I'm wondering if this work isn't a little bit premature. Like I like experimenting and, and I think that's a good thing, mm -hmm. but um, where do we draw the line? Like, and I'm just looking at the working group chairs and the ADs for that. So actually, we do design our algorithms, our protocols so that they have a crypto, crypto agility. So we need to do that here too. So we actually, I prefer to make, want to make sure that our system is so that we can actually run multiple of these mechanisms there. So we can actually do experimental and see what 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 works, what what doesn't, and so on. And yes, uh, I agree that I don't know when we're actually going to be designing which of those algorithms are going to be the mandatory to implement, you know, algorithm or and, and which are must not because they are broken. <laughs> But, but we're talking much more about that than algorithm agility, right? We're not talking, talking about removing AES and putting in cha, cha We're talking about like maybe a different uh, Ike exchange or maybe a different like a whole field or like, like I, I don't want us to commit to any of these sort of yeah, experimental yeah, yeah, that, things. That's why I want to. I and want then to, five years later, throw it away. Yeah, or or I have most, the legacy. Most of, most of these mechanisms are something that is just, uh, we send some big block to the other end and the other end send some, do some, some calculations, send some big, big block back, and then we have a shared secret. I, I guess most of these are this kind of plug-in replacements for Diffie Hellman. If it if there's some algorithm that requires you know seven round trips and doing some weird things in the middle, that's something that is uh, not going to be. For example, the current mechanism is I think works with every every kind of this kind of uh, plug-in uh, uh, algorithm for Diffie Hellman, which has one ex, ex, one one message going that way, one message coming that way, and then we have a shared secret. Uh, yes. Well, I mean, if you go four or five slides back, I see something about um, adding a transform and a little concern about um, if if implementation implementation will take it. If you're adding a transform, it means that you're. you're no, no, but this this is, this is actually I said this is this is bits in the wire that we actually need to decide when we working group will decide how do we actually get it what's best backward compatibility and best best uh, you know forward uh, you know. Uh, Okay, ability. So I, I think that's why I was saying trade. We, we don't need to. We don't want to decide all those now. Uh, Brian Wise, Cisco. I think part of the concern might be um, an IANA registry for algorithms that we know about now, but may want to reject later. How how do we set up an experimental IANA registry? I don't know. So it seems it seems like there's a lot to discuss okay. here. Um, it would be useful to get more comments on the draft and and there on the list. On oh Spot yes. One, two. Sorry, well, we're going to go to meet Echo. Hi, uh, can you guys hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Good. Uh, Philip LaFrance, ICERA Corporation. So uh, I just want to express support for this document because this problem is something that we've dedicated some resources to. And we essentially came up with pretty similar conclusions and solutions as, as you guys did. So we would love to help out with this draft in any way that we can. So we, we definitely you. think it's a good idea. It is still a little early, obviously, but we definitely want to see where this goes. OK, thanks. But thank you very much. OK, uh, I just okay. want to basically, there's been, uh, there's been complaints about the complexity of it. Uh, uh, there are basically two complex questions here that they're trying to address. One is, is how to, to actually have a, a both a traditional and a post-quantum algorithm because we don't necessarily trust a post-quantum out of the box. In fact, I would, actually, I would advise asking, allowing multiple post-quantum algorithms. The other question is, is how to do fragmentation. Other than those two questions, the problem is completely trivial. <laughs> Th 
thanks. Thank you. Hello, this is Kai. And uh, almost everything's said. Uh, I don't want to waste time on motivation and solution. Uh, we did some experiments with uh, Mac LEs some years ago, and the key size of Mac LEs is way beyond 64K, by the way. Uh, last year, the New Hope algorithm showed up, and uh, there was an implementation in StrongSwan, and we also did some experiments with that. We did some measurements, and anybody who is interested in some comparison numbers, uh, I'm, I love to share that. And so, um, but these are PQ only mechanisms and uh, what we heard today and yesterday and what the common solution at the moment from the crypt uh, cryptographers is to, to have a combined weight uh, or mechanism by uh, classical DH and by P PQ. And next slide, please. Uh, as we heard, there's no simple drop in solution. Uh, we have this fragmentation issue that has to be solved. And uh, if we use the uh, TCP uh, thing, then, yeah, that's debatable. But uh, it, it was by purpose to, to use Ike over UDP. Uh, we have some pros and cons to move the quantum safe key exchange into the Ike auth exchange. Uh, that, uh, that makes the Ike SA not quantum safe, but uh, as we already discussed or heard, uh, this might not be a problem because it doesn't address active attacks at the moment. And uh, yeah, the other thing is the signaling issue that uh, is also yeah maybe more uh, difficult to solve uh, where to put this combined exchange. Um, we can use a new transform type for uh, post quantum safe agreement. Uh, then we uh, can combine these uh, transforms in an uh, SA payload. Uh, but what I what I see is that the key exchange payload is currently uh, cannot refer to a specific transform uh, type. It, it only refers to tra transform ID. So. Uh, we cannot easily combine uh, different key exchange payloads uh, in the in the exchange, or we can have a transform type for combined method. So that ac that explicitly says I want to combine two method uh, to key exchange uh, variants, and maybe we need both to phase out non PQ agreements in the future. So, uh, but that's something that. I love to discuss in, in the working group if the working group is uh, going to adopt this problem. Thank you. Any comments on these ideas? So I have to apologize for not knowing Ike well enough, but. Um, yeah, if you're not gonna, if you're gonna specify it as if it were alternative to Diffie Hellman, right? You want to be, be sure you signal. I can't use this alone. Um, so I don't, I don't know. Is it? Is, that's the point of the second, the second point, which is that combined is how you would say I won't use this without Diffie Hellman. Yeah. I mean, it's like it's, it's like really bad if you just use the PQ thing without Diffie Hellman. Uh, Dan, Dan Harkins. So uh, it, it seems to me that <clears throat> moving this. QE payload or you know uh, KE payload or whatever to the Ike auth exchange solves two problems, right? It's gonna it's gonna fix the fragmentation problem because there's already an RC for doing Ike fragmentation, and it addresses the backwards compatibility issue because you can in the Ike SA negotiation you can send some notify that says you know I do quantum, but by the I do the PCQ uh, PCKE thing, and the other guy will either if he doesn't send it back, then you know that you're you're unable to send the 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 PQKE and the and the the Icothix exchange. So I think I think there's really no argument for putting that in the in the Icoth exchange. It just causes two problems that uh, That was our conclusion too for the moment, yeah. And and as Eric said, you know the the what we lose is uh, identity protection if somebody does 
uh, break uh, an ECDH. Yeah, but, but maybe we don't care at the moment. Yeah, that's Okay, so, oh, do you have still comment about this? Yeah, just quick, because because both this presentation and the previous one are mumbling about transform types. So I do want to make my point about transform types, that if we add a new transform type, you're yes. basically du doubling the proposals because you have to have yes. a list of proposals and not proposals. We have and we've already did this once for AADs, and so now we're going to have four proposals for each thing. It's going to get silly. It's, it's going to get I version 1 again, which had... 250 oh actually it was limited to 256 uh, pr proposals that's why we couldn't propose everything so anyway so this is something as i said our current charter says that we do about the same uh, post quantum protection we have in like version one meaning the preset key type of thing this is uh, out of our current charter we are going to be rechartering anyway in singapore because we our charter ends in 2017 december so we and I, this is something that i think there is clear, you know, I would actually want to get hum if, if you think that we should actually include this in charter so we can actually get ready to in, by the by the Singapore, the chartering discussion. So who are in favor of adding some kind of, you know, not be not a preset key based on, uh, you know, uh, uh, post quantum crypto uh, algorithm thing in Ike version in, in the charter. Uh, for the uh, for the next charter, not necessary. This document, not necessary. You know, uh, not tying with any any specific algorithm, not tying to the specific signaling method. Just any something. So, who those who are in favor of now? And those That's who called it, Philip. and those who object. Okay, so I think it's clear that we are going to be adding this asset to the charter item, and there seems to be quite strong. You know harm of uh, adding this so i think there is probably going to be people interested about okay thank you um no that we do not um Ready to send notebooks? Okay. Is there a new one? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm just going to test the mic so long, huh? <laughs> if not, you could just use the ones from Elvig yesterday. Um, I could try to find the Elvig ones. Yeah, they are probably in meeting material place. So these are these, the ones that you that we are in our meeting materials are old. Can you actually yeah, send yeah. it? Just send it. Just send it, okay. Then I send it. That's my guess. Yes. <laughs> if you upload them, I'll yeah, download them real quick. Why don't you go ahead and introduce your topic, and then we'll get the slides up in a sec. OK, so uh, our topic is a minimal GIKV2 implementation, so a group-based uh, Internet Key Exchange. And it is minimal in so far that it's a subset of the actual protocol that is meant to be run on a constrained client. And uh, what we did is actually only the implementation, so there's no draft or whatsoever. And uh, we got some nice numbers about our tests. And I can totally understand now how you cannot read it in the mirror. <laughs> so I don't know. You, you could just look at 
up in the Elvik group. I guess they had the slides from yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm not good at stand up comedy, so I'm sorry. Singing? You wouldn't want to hear that. <laughs> I, that looks better. So, <laughs> once again, a minimal TIQ2 client. The draft that is linked there is not ours, but the original uh, TIQ2 draft, yes, you can just stay there. And <laughs> so, um, how far is it minimal? What, what we do is just uh, reduce the protocol to a subset required to get a SA and maintain it. And, uh, the result can be seen here. So different to the normal IQ2, we have got a communication between a constrained client and a key server. Uh, the first step, Ike SA init, is the same as in the normal IQ2, actually the same as in the minimal IQ2. Um, second step is a bit specific to the GSI auth. You still send an identity and authentication value, but there's no negotiation going on here. So. Additionally, you send a group ID, which uh, which uh, says you wish to join that group, and the key server authenticates you, decides if you are allowed to join a group, and then answers you with its own authentication and identity and uh, the SA properties and the corresponding keys. And uh, GSA rekey looks pretty much the same as the response to GSA auth as uh, you get uh, authentication, GSA properties, and the corresponding keys. And there's two sets of keys, the transport keys and key encryption keys, one which you use for the communication in the group, the second it's used for the rekeying. So next slide, please. So our implementation is built on Riot OS. In, on the top, you can see a theoretical, um, theoretical RAM usage of our implementation, so we uh, figure out it's going to be around six kilobyte. And on the bottom, you can see the parameters we used. So we used AES 128 CBC for encryption, I SHA 265 for integrity, and I SHA 1 for the pseudo randomness, and uh, the SACP 256 R1 for Diffie Hellman, which is only because we didn't have any other. Uh, Diffie Hellman group supported on these uh, devices. And uh, we tested this on three different devices the Arduino Uno, M0, and Duo. And uh, as it turned out, the Arduino Uno is uh, just too limited in memory to fit the actual implementation. So, and uh, only has good two kilobytes of RAM. So, that's it about that. For the other two, we uh, took some time measurements. Next slide, please. So what you can see here from the left to right are the steps in the protocol, the preparation of the SA init, processing of the SA init, preparation of the auth, and processing the auth. And um, what you can see here, the big one, <laughs> is the Diffie-Hellman shared secret calculation, which is quite big compared to the rest, but actually a quite good result. Like, on the, on the right side, you can see these are packets encrypted with uh, the AES, which actually don't really uh, take much time. And uh, I guess 400 milliseconds or 188 for the uh, shared Diffie-Hellman secret is quite a nice result here. Next slide, please. So again, how did we do the minimalization? We just... Uh, took away optional payloads and reduced it to all you need to get to the SA and to maintain it. And uh, it would actually be interesting to specify a server configuration. As our main problem, or the biggest messages we had to handle were the server messages, which included a lot of vendor ID payloads, notification payloads, and so on. Uh, next slide, please. We will release our implementation on GitHub. 
I guess it's going to be somewhere around the next week, next two weeks. And um, I would be interested in your opinions on whether this should be documented in some form on minimalizations. And uh, yes, that's it from my side. Hi, uh, Brian Mari Cisco. So just for the sake of um, people who aren't familiar with this, this GIQ2 is a draft that uh, Valerie and Yov and I have that's uh, meant to protect multicast IPsec. It's, um, there's a, uh, we weren't looking at the constrained case, but it's really quite interesting to see that um, it, it looks like it could, at least the group member side can run on the constraints case and can run with a, a commercial version of a, of a key server. Um, I think it'd be interesting to see this work with the uh, minimal ESP and then a, a small application to actually show that it works on these small constrained devices. Uh, Queen Deng, um, I have a question. Um, you would like to be minimal in your space. Uh, why do you implement both HMAX in, in, the, in that base? Uh, that's actually a good question, yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> And, and also for the uh, strange a little bit, for the BIF, you truncate the uh, SHA-1 to 96, so it's, 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 it's really bad to do that. Um. Yes, um, the actual algorithms we use are not part of the minimalization itself, so it's more about the minimal protocol, protocol messages you need uh, in order to get there. You can still choose your parameters, like quite similar to the minimal Ike, which was released last year. And uh, you are totally right, <laughs> but... Uh, but as you, if I understand correctly, those actual algorithms are coming from the operating system. Yes. So, yes. so it's, it might be there anyway. I don't know if, you can, if it actually removes them. Or if it might be using them for other yeah. things also. So it might not. Might so, help, but might not. <laughs> actually, yeah, that's right. If you're using the crypto module, they're going to be there. Um, I'm, I think 4307biz actually says something about you should use the same algorithm for PRF and Intec. Um, that's yeah, but I don't, I don't think it's an issue here. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, but so so I have one question here because we actually this is for area director also. So wake up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so this is again this is uh, the uh, not minimal version, but this normal uh, Ike version two group uh, you know key management in Ike version two is draft that has been out for starting from 2010 or something like that and it, because MSEC uh, group is dead it can't go there and of course there was a discussion about should we actually have it you know AD sponsored or should we take in the working group of course we are going to be rechartering Singapore so that's actually a very easy place to take it in and advance it through the working group instead of uh, advancing through the area director so that's actually one of the things I want to ask for area director's comments which you prefer People ask me to be more clear about area director versus not. So this is as area director. Um, uh, I prefer things to go through the working group. I would prefer things to go through the working group. All right. So then I have Kristen Group. I mean, I'm not taking a position on this particular topic, but like in general, things go through the working group. I haven't thought about this draft really. All right. But so so I have a question for the group then. Uh, who would think that this actually would be useful to document this in uh, to have this uh, uh, GDO, G Ike version two to go through the working group and uh, to be a working group uh, item or add it to the charter so we can actually work in it. This would, this would actually be this specific draft going through, but we have to get change control if we want to change it. So those who are, uh, who actually think that we can actually answer that question? <laughs> Sorry, Paul. I'm a little confused if we're talking about the group. A specification being added or the minimal yes, group specification group, being added? group key management, because we have to have that one before we're going to have a minimal. I think the minimal actually belongs to the LVIG, not in here, because if we here we only do things that are, you know, modifying the protocol. The minimal ones try to stay within the protocol, but just specify what you need to implement. So I wonder if you can actually make a hum here or should we? No, let's. Let's make a hum here. We can always fail it. <laughs> so, so who thinks that we should add this uh, group I person to, to as a working item into the for the next charter? Hum now. Okay. Who thinks that we shouldn't be doing this and it should go somewhere else? 
Okay, I think we are going to add that on the asset charter item for the next uh, Singapore. So anyway, thank you. And I really like the numbers. So it was very small. <laughs> Hello, I'm Valery Smyslov. Uh, next, please. So, uh, uh, I will be short. So, uh, you'll probably uh, just remind you a few things about my bike. My bike is a uh, protocol that is used in, uh, in IQ2, an extension to IQ2, that allows peace to change the IP addresses of SAs without uh, full reestablishing of SAs. Uh, so, the uh, yeah, it uses a rather simple approach, just send uh, information exchange containing uh, updated addresses notification and from uh, using the new addresses. Uh, next, please. So this is uh, this picture just shows how, how mobile works, just as, as an example. So first, SA is established. Uh, it's it's uh, oversimplified, but uh, some uh, things are left out, but essential things are uh, shown. So first we have ICASA init and ICAOS exchange that both where both peers indicate that they, that they support Mobike. And when uh, initiator uh, want to change uh, its IP address, it sends uh, updated say, addresses notification using a uh, new address in this uh, example, IP double I. And uh, so respond the uh, response and uh, updates its uh, addresses, uh, addresses of say, so both initiate and respond and move to a new address. And next, please. Uh, uh, the mobile has uh, one limitation. Well, in general, uh, only original uh, uh, initiator is responsible for changing IP address. Uh, it, it is even states in uh, section 2.1 of RFC uh, 4555. And, uh, uh, so, uh, if NOT is in between, then uh, depending on the NOT behavior, original responder may not initiate update, may or may not initiate update, because uh, NOT can block incoming connection without uh, uh, previously seen packets uh, going outside. And uh, uh, if original responder is multi-homed, then it may not be able to uh, instruct initiator to switch, say, to another address, even if you want to. So uh, mobile can generally permit original responder to, to try address update procedure, but in presence of that, it will most probably fail. Uh, well, mobile uh, has a not prohibition mode, uh, where both peers uh, state that uh, not is not allowed. In this case, uh, everything uh, would probably work, but I think that this case is mostly useless in real world because nuts are, nuts are uh, almost everywhere currently. And next, please. Uh, so the cause of the limitation is the network asymmetry introduced by restricted con nuts. Uh, this is just an example. So if uh, Responder address uh, is changed, so it wants to change uh, SA address to IP double R. It tried to send information exchange, but uh, with no mapping, this packet will probably drop by net in between. So uh, as a result, SA is deleted. So next, please. Uh, uh, this limitation has a negative effect. First, uh, for example, use case when responder is a cluster comprising of nodes each having uh, its own IP address but uh, sharing uh, security credentials. Uh, the cluster uh, cannot on its will move uh, say from one node to another, for example, for load balancing purposes. Uh, uh, the other uh, effect is that if, uh, for example, respond is multi-homed and one of its interfaces uh, shuts down, it cannot quickly instruct an initiator to move uh, say to existing, uh, say, to another uh, interface, it, it must wait until initiator detects the failure due props and uh, perform switching to another address. Uh, next, please. So, uh, proposed solution is as follows. Uh, so, responder uh, requests initiator to move, say, to a new address by initiated informational exchange uh, 
uh, inside this exchange a new notification switched to IP address which contains a new responder's address. address. And uh, to deal with uh, middle boxes, this exchange is initiated from old SA address. So, but initiator responds uh, to a new responder's address which is inside uh, notification. So, uh, no, that, that it is a violation of section 2.11 uh, on RFC 7296 that requires that responder, uh, responder of exchange always respond to address where uh, package came from, uh, from. So, okay. <laughs> well, after that, initiator immediately starts standard mobile procedure to move to update the addresses. So, question or shall I move? Okay, <laughs> next please. <clears throat> so this is just an illustration. So uh, when responder want to uh, switch it, uh, to move existing SA to address APRR, it sends, uh, uh, it starts uh, information exchange from uh, old address uh, in blue, APR, but APRR is inside uh, information payload. So initiator gets this uh, exchange. So it, it comes through the node because it uses existing mapping. And after that, initiator responds to this new address, IP double R in green. And it creates a new mapping on net. So that uh, uh, the next packet that will be sent, so uh, the next communication, uh, communication that will take place after that will go through not smoothly. So the next, please. So uh, interaction with mobile it is very it, it is very easy to add a support uh, support negotiation for this extension is uh, we can uh, use uh, data uh, uh, data of a notification for mobile supported which is currently currently empty and uh, must be ignored for unsupported uh, uh, mobile peers. So if we, we can add here uh, sing, even a single byte or some predefined strings, it will indicate that uh, initiates to support this extension. So next, please. So thanks. What do you think? All right, Darok, I think it's a very bad idea to start poofing packets. To send packets that uh, from the IP address that you don't own is going to be dropped anyway, because I mean, the first uh, first hop router will check that, oh, I get this address that is not belonging to any of my uh, interfaces. It shouldn't be coming from here and uh, doing source address validation. It actually drops a packet. Well, uh, they should be doing that. <laughs> well, they don't do it, but they should be doing it. Well, uh, uh, but, but, but it, uh, and, and I guess uh, they will do that more and more because the address proof is something that is, you know, considered an attack and people mm -hmm. are trying to, uh, uh, you know, protect against it. So, so and, and making a protocol that relies on being able to send spoofed packets well, is a bad uh, idea. It is, it, is not, it is not really spoofed packets. Actually, it is because you both, don't own well, well, both interfaces can be up. You are owner of both addresses. It so is, you just want to switch from one, yeah, from that, one of your addresses that, that, to that's, another. That, that's a different case. If you own no. both of the addresses, if you if you are in two interfaces, you have a you know Wi-Fi and you have a yes. 3G and you are and I want to down move, the Wi-Fi, yes. You can actually do that already in a mobile. You send an address update, but you delete the first address, the, the, the Wi-Fi address. You only keep the keep the uh, 3G uh, address, and then the, then the initiator will notice that oh, the address that I'm using actually got lost. So I need to do address update now myself to update uh, to start using the other address. So that actually works already. The only case where it actually you, 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 which doesn't work is that when you lose the address completely. When you then you don't have an address a packet or address you could send the packet to the other end, and if you lose the address, then you don't own the address anymore, so you can't use it. Well, uh, that would probably work, but it doesn't. Uh, well, it doesn't allow the respondent to. Um, uh, well, after that, after that procedure that uh, you've explained, uh, the uh, initiator will, uh, on its wheels, uh, move uh, to previous address. Because uh, then you said uh, update the addresses with both addresses again, I think. So you cannot control, you cannot uh, force him to uh, switch to one particular address. It is more preferred to you to respond there. For load balancing, it is very important. So uh, you, you, you will probably persuade uh, initiator to move to another address, but once again, you will uh, update the addresses for both addresses and uh, it will switch again back. So this is just still, still as a me as not as a share, but, but yes, in that case, 
I think yes, it, switching to new address, telling data and that you should switch to this address and all of, all of the addresses is still fine. And that's actually one of the things we can, can specify. But having something that's saying, oh, we use this spoofed address and we send packets from this spoof address, that I think they will get quite a lot of discussions in a, you know, from uh, IADs anyway, if we okay. start doing that. So, so I don't propose, but anyway, we're actually running, okay, now as a chair, we are running out of time, <laughs> <laughs> but you can still respond. <laughs> So, uh, okay, this is just uh, one of the proposals, but uh, I, I want to reiterate is the problem exists. Uh, probably we should consider it, uh, uh, finding some solution. All right, so from the working group, again, this is something that we might be able to want to take as an item, some kind of this kind of item. Uh, no, not say, particular. Uh, yeah, not particular, but I mean, for the, for the because there is, mobile is still, related to IPsec, so it actually could be part of this working group or could not, so this is actually something we have to decide. It currently isn't in the charter. This is something that we can also add into the charter if we want. We have to talk with the area director about that, and because it's a little bit more further away than, you know, than uh, other things, we actually, I think when we want to talk with the area director first, so I don't take a hum now, but we will think about this and decide on Singapore what we are, if we are going to work on this, or this kind of thing, or add this into charter. So, uh, Brett Jordan, I would like to echo your point. Um, so long as this does not include the ability to spoof an IP. Spoofing an IP is bad from every which way from Sunday. So if uh, as long as that's clarified, then great. Um, but if it even remotely has the option of having a spoofed IP, then I would be against it. Yeah, we had a lot, of, a lot of discussion about this when we there was text in our TCP encapsulation about using port 443, and there was 80 comments, quite a lot of people about that. All right, so I think thanks, and we till then we have one more presentation, Diet ESP, and we have we have about five minutes. It was allocated to you. <laughs> that was the time of allocated to you. <clears throat> So hi, Tobias here. Um, I will just quickly present a status update on Diet ESP. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so for those who don't know, we discussed it quite a few times also here. And the last time we really did discussed it was in Berlin in the six low meeting because it's um, about compressing the ESP packet. And there was quite some support that people wanted to use IPsec in constrained environments. But because it's more IPsec related, we were asked to move back here. And we kind of redesigned the diet ESP design we had before. We moved to something which is more similar to the, um, what is, uh, we now call it ESP header compression. It's not based on rock anymore. It's more similar to the SHIC they tried to um, specify for LP1s. And yeah, um, we have some implementations on Contiki, Python, Write, and Linux for the kernel. There's something ongoing. And we also have a publication on that measuring some results that we can actually save um, energy on that. So next slide. <clears throat> so the, the, the idea is to have um, compression rules which define how each field of the ESP packet is going to be compressed. Um, and we have function how it is compressed. For example, send value just means don't compress. Eleted means just elete it and get it from a predefined context. Uh, and diet ESP is one strategy just saying how to use these uh, functions. Uh, next slide. So just some, oh, yeah, the title is kind of missing. Um, you see it at the top. We can save for an IoT VPN scenario, we can save 68 bytes, <clears throat> um, which is quite a lot if you consider the, uh, the scenarios of IoT where we talk about maybe 128 bytes of MTU or even less. And uh, what we define is the one on the right here. Um, basically, everything in the red is pre-negotiated. Uh, the rest is got from traffic selectors and SAs we already have. Next slide. Uh, we also try to be more um, open for other use cases outside IoT. Um, so this would be an example for a traditional VPN. VPN. Um, so we could compress the inner IP packet of a VPN. In this case, it's IPv6. We can also do IPv4 and also IPv4 and IPv6 and IPv6 and IPv4. Um, and also just defining a few compression rules. Yes, uh, next slide. Um, so the question we were thinking about, what is better to actually 
have better compression or more complexity because the better the compression, the more complex is the negotiation. And the second question is how to move forward with this document. <clears throat> Tommy Pauly, Apple. Um, so I guess to the second one, I think this is really cool, and I'd like to see us continue working on it um, and get specified for these concerning environments to make sure that IPsec is a viable option there. Yeah. So I think we should continue working on it. For the first one, I guess based on your work so far, where do you think we are on that scale currently between <clears throat> compression and complexity? So currently, um, kind of the strategy, which we at the moment call by ISP, which, which is a strategy for IoT scenarios, mm -hmm. the complexity of negotiating is very low because we get a lot of stuff which already is there. Um, if we consider other use cases, we can either uh, define new strategies or include it in the strategy, making the strategy more complex. So at the moment, we are trying to minimize the complexity but maximize the compression. That's the current use case on IoT. So that's where well, we are. Right. I mean, that's yeah. ideal what yeah. you would want to do. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, just like looking at your most compressed example, that seems quite good. And <laughs> I think I would be happy with that on the really constrained devices. Yeah. And so I think that's a, I think it's at a good place mm -hmm. in that regard. Okay. Thanks. <clears throat> so I think one of the, the, the balance between complexity is um, um, when we have mostly IPv4 in IPv6, or the reverse. Because currently, some compression is, is being made by you, re, you decompress by t taking the parameters from the outer IP, which doesn't match if they are not the same version. So the question is, should we add some complexity at that point, or should we leave, just leave it uncompressed for the regular VPN? Tommy, um, my impression would be leave that simple because um, hopefully a lot of these use cases can, I would like to see them converge on all v6. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> if it's an incentive to keep things in a consistent address family um, to make it more compressed, that's great. Yeah. All right, I have a question. I, I understand that this is still doing exactly the same, you know, when you, you take an ESP bucket, you compress it, you get something that you send, the other end you decompress it, and then you run, get exactly the same ESP bucket back. Yes. Hopefully, ex <laughs> except of course, you know, the sequence number, you, if you don't say, you just assume it's one bigger than the previous one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, true, but on the other hand, there's also sequence number compressions, like Schemes, in six yeah. pen and stuff. Yes, so I, I, was, I, was, I was talking yeah. about, yeah, <laughs> that's probably one of the things that we actually yeah. do want to have a little bit more complexity that we yeah. actually want to recover from cases where sequence number. But, okay, so the question is now is actually, this is okay, something that has been, that DSP has been here a couple of times. And this is, again, it's not something that actually modifies, you know, uh, the the pay payloads in the, or actually it modifies payloads in the wire, but not actually the original yeah. ESP bucket is going to be the same. So this is still kind of some similar kind of thing that could go also as a, uh, like with implementation guidance instead of the here. But I think it actually might be better here because we actually we, we know better here what we can do. Yes. <laughs> so that's why I was thinking about, should we actually add this also in the charter for the, or to the charter discussion for uh, Singapore? Of course, all of this needs to be, you know, confirmed in a, in a list and in, also in, in Singapore, we have to <coughs> get the AD, AD to accept those. So do you think that, uh, I'm going to ask for harm, how many people actually think that this should be included or should not be included in, in, in here, some kind of this DSP? Actually, in this case, it's probably going to be this draft and, uh, of course, modifying it as we go forward. So how many people think that we should include this in Charter? Ham now. Okay, how many people think that we should not include this in the Charter? There must be something wrong with the mic because I, I only only hear, I only hear one hum. We can't be this, you know. <laughs> okay, good, thanks. So, so the mic is working. <laughs> Maybe it's just good to present on Friday afternoon. <laughs> All right. So, so yeah, only the hardcore hardcore IPsec people are here, no tourists. <laughs> Yeah. All right. So, so next question is: any, Has anybody any other topics, or shall we start heading for the airport? <laughs> oh, we have. <laughs> no. 
so uh, Joavn, you're um, also uh, co-chair of I2NSF. So uh, if you've been following the mailing list, there was this uh, thread on both lists about uh, the uh, proposed work item for I2NSF, uh, about uh, having SDN controllers configure IPsec endpoints. And there seems to be a kind of a disconnect between the um, IPsec people, especially the VPN people, as opposed to the uh, data center and SDN people. Uh, so what we're planning to do, uh, other than uh, come and sabotage the I2NSF meeting every time, uh, is uh, to hold a virtual interim meeting. Uh, we'll probably uh, schedule it under the I2NSF, but, and uh, invite people from both groups to discuss and see that if we're even talking about the same thing, they might be just talking about um, transport mode within the data center, in which case uh, the VPN people just shrug and say, ah, okay, we're, what do we care? Or are they really intending to configure uh, VPNs running all over the world, which is kind of not the usual thing you do with SDN, but uh, you know, things begin small, then grow big all over the internet. So uh, expect a doodle poll and then uh, a scheduling of a virtual interim sometimes in the next few weeks. Uh, with the um, RFC 7427, the digital signatures authentication one. Um, so there are two versions for RSA. One could be PSS and another could be PKCS. So we don't really have a way of negotiating this uh, specified in the RFC itself. There is another draft that is uh, 4307 BIS, which says that PSS must be implemented and uh, PKCS may be included. But even then, if we still have to support both, we need to know uh, how we should tell the initiator or the responder that we're choosing that. So could we have a method or a way to figure out what the other person is using because we don't know. And uh, to, de to do the interoperability test right now, StrongSwan uses PKCS and it does not use PSS as mandated. So. Is it is it there actually, if I'm correctly, you can actually see it from the payload well, itself? Uh, it's exactly the same problem that is presented in Civil. So the working group at the turn decided that uh, it is not a real problem, but currently one more people run into it. Okay, so if people want to think about that, you have to propose a charter item for the <laughs> Singapore and think about design, but if you want to, what, what kind of proposal about what we actually want to have. But anyway, has anybody, has everybody signed the blue sheets already? Hopefully, probably. So no, I I do think it's a real problem because the the hash the the notifying the ICE in it for the uh, the signature is just not good enough for us, and we're running into this problem now. And uh, we suspect it will run into more problems later when things get more complicated with post quantum things. So I do think it's something we should consider to put on the charter. All right. So. So I think that's all. So.